So we're live. <laughs> uh, welcome all humans and non-humans to the third Biotopia talk. Uh, it's great to meet again or meet for the first time, some of you. Uh, this time in lovely Wendt Bookstore in Teliskiri. Uh, greetings to the participants on Facebook as well. And today we will talk about eco aesthetics. Uh, what is beauty and how is it seen in eco aesthetics will be revealed shortly. I am a curator and gallerist, Lilian Hiob, and today I'm moderating the talks. Uh, with me on stage are composer, musician, author, and philosopher David Rottenberg, uh, Estonian folk musician and experimental vocalist Vaim Sarv, uh, artist Janika Berna, and professor of biosemiotics at Tartu University, Kalevi Gull. I am extremely honored to moderate this talk uh, with this wonderful group of people. Um, Biotopia Talks event is organized by Estonian Anthropocene Center, MTU, in cooperation with Buent Bookstore, with the aim of engaging and encouraging young people to talk about the topics of art, science, and the environment. The talks is supported by the Civil Society Foundation, uh, Tallinn Urban Environment, and Public Works Department, Witson OU, and Buent. Dear participants, if you have any questions you would like to direct to the panel, uh, please write them down and present them in the end of the discussion. And Facebook, uh, Facebook participants, uh, you can write your questions as comments under the live broadcast and they will be read in the end of our talk. Um, if anyone has really urgent question, please raise your hand, but rather let's keep the questions in the end of the panel. This was the special request from our panelists, so let's respect that. And without further ado, let's get started. I'm taking out my questions, and this is why I'm constantly on my phone, to not to forget any information. Um, so, hello, dear participants, panelists. I'm, as I said, I'm very honored to be here with you, and I'm very excited to hear your thoughts about the questions that I wrote to you. So, let's start with the first one. And before we go into more specific questions, maybe we should start defining what is eco aesthetics uh, we are talking about here. Uh, because it's definitely not paintings of trees nor for the trees, although it's not absolutely uh, out of question. Uh, from At least from my perspective, eco-aesthetics is very much connected with human nature relationship, Anthropocene, neoliberalism, politics, violence, corporate creed, etc. So I thought it might be interesting to maybe tackle the meaning of the term as a warm-up. about qualitative values. Uh, it uh, deals usually uh, with human judgment and taste, but eco-aesthetics is uh, not limited to humans. Eco-aesthetics should include um, judgment and taste of other living beings. Uh, say even more, uh, eco-aesthetics is, I would say, about value itself, qualitative value itself, about intrinsic value of life, about primary qualitative values, about uh, how the values emerge. I would not here separate between bioesthetics or eco-aesthetics, these are very close to each other. So you eco uh, as I'm defining it, is about uh, semiotic fitting. Janika, what do you think as an artist? No, it's on. The professor read the definition. Hmm. 
how do you follow here? Like I, I when I gave this a little thought, you know, I went right away into the utopia, which you know this event is so much about bio, biotopia in Estonian sounds much better even. I'm thinking like what what would be the world like if you didn't need the word bio aesthetics or eco aesthetics? It would be just you know, so organic and, and, and normal to just have aesthetics. We wouldn't have to separate humans and, and, and the other living beings as, as uh, defined. But, but um, so yes, as an artist, I felt like I had to really extract, uh, extract that meaning to say it in words because I realized that this is sort of what my practice has been about, to try to be as symbiotic and as infused with the forces of nature and then bring them in and see what else, what comes out as I take them in. So I don't have a good definition, but I have a utopia of the world where we don't need that term. And where does the human stand in eco-aesthetics? It was a little bit already touched, uh, but maybe you have something to add well, aesthetics is about deciding what is beautiful, trying to figure out what counts as beauty and believing that beauty matters. So if you're going to create a word like eco-aesthetics, you'll be looking at the beauty of nature and you'll try and, and want to take it seriously and think this is important. We need to consider the natural world seriously and that there's something beautiful about it and that this is something worth spending time with. So I think that there's this interest all around the world today that nature should be taken more seriously as a source of, of the beautiful, that it isn't just an old, you know, discarded idea, that we should, we should take this beauty seriously and figure out how we as humans can fit into it. And for me, eco-aesthetics, I, I like breaking the word down to ecological aesthetics. And I'm thinking about Gibson here with his book on perception and sort of ecological perception, the way the mind, the body, and the environment are all very intertwined and very entangled. And thinking as a practicing artist, as a singer, as a performer, performing outside, in non-standard spaces, outdoors. What's going on in that web of perception in the, in the moment of live performance where for me, it's not music, it's ritual. And I consider everything that's happening on the same plane of existence. And I think aesthetics as it used to be studied or, or still is maybe in, in, the, in the dominant model it's a very humanist study. The human is, is privileged. The human is raised up out of the mud, out of this, this web of multi-sensory perceptions, multi-sensory interactions, entanglements. The human is raised up and privileged. And for me, eco-aesthetics is the raising down of the human, coming back to the mud, getting sticky. H human is a part of ecosystem that is that is uh, very important here that a human is is not above human is not uh, uh, the ruler in this way as nobody in uh, in a whole ecosystem cannot be a ruler of all the others human is always a part and that is uh, the basic view f for uh, ecostatic and uh, i i th i think so that means uh, that's also not uh, the relationship of competition, it's a relationship of, of semiosis, because, uh, say, uh, if we would approach uh, in a way that to, to make a better art, what would compete all the other forms um, away because it's better, then that would uh, be the same as humans would compete out the other species. So uh, that is clearly wrong. So therefore, this eco aspect is uh, something very fundamental. And uh, uh, can you tell uh, or think about what are the 
characteristics of eco aesthetic and when did this sort of aesthetical wave take off? Did it have any specific starting point or where, uh, when did the ideas around ecology and aesthetics became relevant? Uh, I think they have changed a lot over time, let's say the 70s and now. Uh, has eco-aesthetics always been around? Uh, is it specifically distinguishable from other art movements or schools of thought like land art or post-humanism? Well, aesthetic admiration of non-art is already eco uh, in, in a way. And that has been always with humans. Uh, we always have admired, I think, uh, well, nature, other species, natural forms, organic forms, say, uh, about uh, or landscapes. Uh, I even think that some birds and mammals can also admire uh, in, in sort of similar aesthetic uh, way, um, say, but of course, uh, this in, as to doing eco aesthetic, well, consciously already knowing about that, that is not so so long time probably. So there were some starts in a way in romantic era, but then since uh, since now ec ec ecology came in, that's in 1960s, 70s. Gregory Bateson was among those first ones. Um, but uh, m more and more now in this current century, of course. I was, uh, Onika, you wanted to yeah, say I something. I to, I thought like I wouldn't pretend that I, I know to really what to say. <laughs> no, you all know what to say. It's, well, maybe uh, maybe it's I can. No, look, actually have a, a, a re read, uh, you know, history reading. I wouldn't, I would make it up. I could do that. Because uh, uh, from my like art theoretician background, I, I wouldn't say that I know that there is something written about eco aesthetics as, as like an art wave or anything like that. It's, it's something different. The term comes from somewhere else than from, from the fine arts field, I think. But I think the beauty of nature and that it's a place to get artistic ideas is probably one of the oldest notions and in the 80s when I went to college and studied these things all my professors said this was made up in the 70s and then later I went and found that it's already in Aristotle somebody they didn't like too much because he was like too traditional should be down with Aristotle but Aristotle said you know the same things that John Cage said came from the East which is that he wanted art to work in the manner of nature that it to follow nature in its manner of operation. It made it seem like this was a new or Eastern or Asian idea, and it's right there in Western culture all the way at the beginning. And, and uh, you know, so I think we should realize this has always been around, this tendency, and it comes and goes depending how people decide it's important or, or not. I guess to comment on the, the, just speaking personally, I was born in 97, so I'm 24 years old. I've been reading philosophy maybe for a decade. And in that timeline, what I see emerge, why eco-aesthetics is sort of becoming incre increasingly relevant or more talked about, and these different ways of thinking through non-human, human life, those interactions, it's responding to crisis. I think a lot of people on this planet who happen to get access to information and go to college, et cetera, PhDs, art theory, whatever, you name it, they're also feeling this crisis that a lot of other people are living materially. But I think, at least I in my own life, feel this impetus to think through these entanglements because of the crisis that I sense we're all in and that we're all entangled in, too. Uh, Post-humanist philosophy and aesthetics also decentralized uh, human position and human perspective. And post-humanism also is giving agent agency to different forms of life and non-human beings. Um, but also it gives agency to machines, uh, artificial intelligence, viruses, etc. I wanted to ask, are we talking about post-humanism here, but in a different term? And by post-humanism, I count on Francesca Ferrando's ideas here who says that post-humanism is not after human, 
but after humanism philosophy, where humanist pr philosophy put the man in the center of knowledge production, and so post-humanism is taking the man down from its hierarchical position. I think there's a danger in post-humanism. It's just continuing the sense that humans are the most important thing. Like, I really don't like this idea of the Anthropocene. Like, we think we're so important, we're now in charge, we're now really changing the environment. This is the Anthropocene. But we're nothing. We're just one little species, we're doing a little thing here. We think we're so great, in a few hundred thousand years, poof, there's nothing. Nature goes on, it doesn't really need us, we're not that important. Machines are not taking over, just more little human stuff. And we're gonna be some blip in evolution that peters out because this is a bad strategy like flies and cockroaches, this is a good strategy. They'll last for millions of years. Humans aren't gonna last so long because we take ourselves too seriously. We won't sit back and say, nature is out there and we're just one tiny little thing here. We make up names to put us in charge and we think we're not doing that. We have a really hard time learning from other species than ourselves. Wow, we get there, got there already. <laughs> we have a long time ahead. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know. Um, I am curious, though. I've never been very, very interested in, in uh, you know, artificial intelligence and technology-related possibilities. But in some ways, I could say that when I was in graduate school in New York, I did. I was much more interested. And then now I've moved away, big leaps, and back to pencil and paper and movement and real moment in time. But I am actually curious because I see how I, you know, we have some younger generation here, like the, if the technology is so organic part of, like it's, it could be an extension to understanding, connecting, relating. Like the video camera was for me when I was watching on Manhattan shore, like a waves coming in and I, I filmed it and that was 15 or 17 years ago, and then slowed it down, and I felt actually the technology brought me really closer to, to nature. So I'm, I'm curious about it, although I don't practice it, but I, you know. I just, uh, want, to, I, I just yeah. want to say something about this post-humanism is that uh, I'm talking about this post-humanist, like after the humanist philosophy here, so transhumanism is something totally different, uh, which is connected to the IA and machines, but I'm more talking about or thinking about the philosophy and the philosophical differences between humanism and, and what if the humanist philosophy is taken down, if, if it sounds clear. So but what's an example of it being taken down? Like a story where here, human exactly, is down. Uh, Do you have exactly a good example? the things that we are talking about here, this eco aesthetics and collaborating with nature and other beings and forms of life and losing this hierarchy between human and, uh, and nature. And, and this is the, like the perfect example of this post humanism uh, which I was talking about. But yeah, just to make it maybe more clear to the listeners as well that there are like many schools of thought about post-humanism, so it's, it's important to understand that this post-humanism uh, is like under, uh, uh, post-humanism is this umbrella term where it goes, like under this umbrella is transhumanism, voluntary human extension, then this post-humanist philosophy that I was mentioning, and so on, so it's, um, it's a little bit like nuanced term, and this is wh why I wanted to make sure that we are talking about the same thing. Well, uh, posthumanism, of course, did a good thing in in terms of uh, well paying attention that humans and animals are not so different. Uh, however, I think that on the other hand, humans and uh, uh, other living beings are pretty different. For instance, in uh, in that aspect that that uh, uh, he, no other living beings could uh, event that large mistakes than humans can do that. So uh, there is a, truly a big difference. Uh, so, but the more important aspect, uh, I think, is togetherness. So uh, humans as parts of the ecosystem and the togetherness of the other living beings, that's, that's crucial. So mistakes define humans.
mostly. <laughs> I mean, we haven't lasted here on that, that long, right? So yeah. it must be yeah, not so smart. Um. Yeah, but some of us have been on the field for quite uh, quite a time, like Kolavi and David, you have been practicing uh, this over 30, 40 years. So I wanted to ask <laughs> what has been the most significant change in the mentality of people, the politics around the concept of nature and how we perceive it? Excellent question. One thing that has not changed is over the entire time I've been interested in this, we've all thought the world was about to end. So when I was already like in, in elementary school, I started to feel like then the, the nuclear war was coming, we had to hide underneath the school, you know, duck and cover. It was all gonna blow up, there was no hope. We always had just a few years, or it was all going down. And we still kind of believe that. So the sense of crisis has always been around. One view of what's changed is that everybody now thinks nature and, and the environment is important. You know, it was in the 1970s, they were talking about this greenhouse effect stuff, climate change. This is all coming. It's really for a long time, this has been there. And it, it, it's not like it's new. But now, people, more people realize its importance. So in that sense, it's spread. So these are, the, in a sense, a positive sense. Everyone knows this problem is here. The most negative thing is the strange polarization between different points of view. That's a little hard to explain because like, uh, again, when I was in high school, we would study government. Let's study how the politicians vote and everybody would vote differently. Every individual would sometimes vote for these left-wing things, sometimes these right-wing things. And the teacher would say, this is how democracy works. Everyone thinks for themselves, in, even in politics. And now it's either you're all on this side or all on that side. If you disagree, they kick you out. They don't allow any real thought. So why has that happened? There's a lot of people who, who wonder, but what's missing is people really thinking for themselves and, being, and, and, and not being afraid to disagree with their tribe. Everyone's supposed to follow the tribe. And I think that's a dangerous direction. We need more individual thinking where people disagree with each other, spend more time delving deeper into different ideas. But uh, in one sense, I'm optimistic that the problems involving with nature are touching many more people today. But the problem in, in solving them is people are, don't like to talk to those who disagree with them. But isn't it paradoxical that people are more aware of, uh, of this problem, but the corporations are doing more and more to destroy everything? I mean, corporations want to make money, and they have a lot of power. They're motivated by profit. They get things done. People like professors who argue about stuff, we don't have to get anything done. So they're busy changing the world. And they figured out, actually, look at the things people are really good at, like Facebook living, presenting videos instantly around the world. We can do that now. We can get any information we want right now, but people are not reading anything. They're not spending time with all this information. We just like follow our prejudices, like get someone else who agrees with me. Like I agree with Kalavi, who does he agree with? Let's get all his friends and we all together agree with each other. Agree, agree, agree. The technology doesn't encourage people to sit down and think, delve deeply into stuff. We are in a bookstore. That's right. You should <laughs> read. Everyone knows you should read, but you know, people say, I have no time to read. I got to keep track with my branding of myself and these 12 different sites, and I got to be checking what's happening right now. And so to actually sit and like, take in knowledge more carefully takes a lot of time just on one thing, and people have a tendency not to want to do that. It's uh, really surprising uh, how difficult it uh, has been to understand conditio humana or the, our role of humans and what humans' role in the, in the world is. So uh, it's still ongoing, that understanding. Uh, and, but uh, what has been changed within this uh, last uh, decades? Uh, so there was already a warning about limits of growth uh, in 1970s, uh, but the statement that economic growth should be stopped has arrived public media only recently, but it has. Uh, 
there was a warning about uh, fossil fuels and climate change, uh, well, decades ago, uh, but uh, understanding that we should globally use at least three times less energy than we currently do has arrived even academics only in the 21st century. So there is, I think, a change towards a better, but still the understanding is much too partial. Uh, I have a question about uh, romanticizing uh, nature versus living truly with nature, which I feel has happened quite a lot as as we heard just now the worries about the nature and how to keep it wild has always been around. But I feel that, for example, me, I'm born in 1991, and why you are born in 1997, you said, right? So I think there has been some sort of shift in mentality. Like, for example, if I'm thinking about uh, my grandparents, they were truly living with nature in the sense that they were respecting every berry that was growing on their bush, like they didn't uh, leave anything unused and they really respected the fact that, uh, that nature was around them and they, were, they knew all the nature's stories and when to pick what, etc. And also knowing all the noises and sounds of the, of the forests and sort of like living this zero waste life, which is now a trend. Uh, and I'm also like I'm also in the wave of this trend like I'm learning from my grandmother now like how to I don't know take up the potatoes from the ground how to ferment some uh, some cucumbers etc although she has always been doing it but I have never like given it a second thought and and now I'm sort of like romanticizing it and uh, and also trying to learn it and I feel so empowered by it, by it. And also it's this trend on social media as well. Like it's very kind of like you see in the summer that everybody is in the forest and, uh, and picking different uh, berries and like uh, fermenting something, but it's not the same as living together with the nature. So, and, and this shift has been quite fast, I think. Uh, so I was thinking to kind of talk about maybe a little bit about this romanticizing the nature and living with the nature versus actually living with it because you need it. Because, of course, Soviet time versus consumer capitalism are totally different territories. And my grandmother just needed to have this uh, potatoes to survive. But, but for me, it's sort of like an exotic thing to do, to grow my own potatoes. But, but uh, more than that, maybe there is there is something else that needs to be discussed than the change of the regime. It's for you. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm just thinking about kind of what you're talking about are like people's ideas or like a cultural change that's happened. But I guess I just want to point out that materially, if these young people are practicing this and having this kind of relationship, it's actually the, the effect is the same as the grandparents. The beliefs have changed, maybe it's romanticized, but the plants might be being taken care of or related to the same way as the grandparents. The land might be sort of taken care of the same way, like just materially speaking. Ideas have changed and it's a trend, but just I think there's a material effect that is actually really important and can't be discounted, even if it's a trend. But even like fermenting something, for example, your microbiome is becoming better off. You're becoming a healthier person by having a dirtier microbiome if you're fermenting. That's a great thing, I think. Whether it's a trend or not, there's a material effect there. Yeah, we'll see. I, I think one should understand that, uh, accept that uh, 20th century was very much wrong. 20th century made a wrong turn in introducing excessive uh, Non, not so, so, uh, yeah, uh, non renewable uh, sources of energy, uh, excessive I I additional input of energy into ecosystem, and thus, as a result, separating ourselves from physical work. So, and that's it. So, uh, the, actually, that is uh, the problem of just doing physical work. 
Yeah, like I'm sort of thinking, following up from you, that it's it's a tough one, uh, you know, after living what, 24 years now in the States and trying to give to the next generation or tell your friends about, you know, the things that now are a trend. But I'm really careful about it because it also comes with worshiping communism or something. It's like, oh, so you want to go back to blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a tough thing. And I'm like, you know, there were some good things. But I hear you both because it's, it is a very different to have the actual need. So did our grandparents, or in my case, my parents, did they do it because it was good for the earth? Or did they do it to have food and bring us, bring up their kids and, and just, um, so I don't know, I don't, we don't have the answer to it, but it's a, it's a, uh, yeah. That's the word. Yeah, this is, this is what I was thinking as well, that our grandparents or my grandparents didn't do it because it's good for our, our like gut, you know, they did it because they needed to survive. But, but yeah, I mean, also trend is trend and if it's if it does good for the mentality of the people and nature then it's just in a little bit different form this respecting nature and learning from nature but it's still there and i think it's very welcomed trend i wouldn't agree i would don't agree that they did it because in order to survive even in soviet times so that was uh, just a, uh, well it's a good thing to do so uh, this is what I am that's told. They enjoyed very much, uh, many of them enjoyed that. They couldn't not to do that, say, uh, simply one should understand that non-ecological life is just wrong. They did it for aesthetic reasons, in right. other words. Precisely. Uh, that is aesthetics of that kind of work. That was a tough work, though. It was like... Uh, I see it between even my both my parents. One did it for fun and joy, and didn't really care if it wasn't done so perfectly or anything came out. But my other parent would be like, it's like you know, after her day job, coming and weeding all these gardens, and we lazy kids, we didn't pick the berries even in August. We didn't do our. So anyway, I, I, of course, I understand physical impact is physical, right? You can't deny that. You go, you work. Actually, just the other day, I was watching my mom coming with a scythe at our summer house, like 7 a.m. She's already coming back while I'm trying to be quiet in our summer house, like not to <laughs> wake her up. And she's already coming back, and she's kind of the happiest looking ever. So there is the physical joy of doing things. Yes, that's undeniable. And she's only like 84 years old. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, corporate greed. So Granul Invest, an Estonian company that cuts down Estonian forests and sell them as a cheap heating material across the world, took out 10 million of clean profit this year on the price of our all well-being. Um, let's play a game uh, as hard at it as it is. Let's try not to demonize them, but imagine what they think about the forests they are cutting and about the eco aesthetics. I'm sure that they go to the sea with their big yachts and maybe even walk a dog in a forest. But how did they evolve their ethics so backward? And what do you think is eco aesthetics for these people? They would say, what are you worrying about? We just cut down some trees, we'll plant some more. It's a renewable resource. We're getting the most profit, the fastest we can get from the trees, and we'll just plant some more. And uh, corporations exist not to save nature, but to uh, you know, make money. That's probably what they would say. It gets more disturbing when th there was a story a few weeks ago, the government of Congo, which had this, has these national parks they've set up, and they decide they're gonna open it all up to logging and mining and, and somebody said, yeah, our government's in the business of making money. Not s we don't want to save the planet. We have no interest in that. So you can understand why companies would do that. But when whole countries start to think that, then you realize this capitalism may have gone too far. But I still want to imagine, w would they go into that clear-cut area and, and enjoy sunset? Is that, like, I'm really trying to be where Lillian is sort of asking the question from. Just the aesthetics, uh, just the... In the environment, like where you, you've helped you. 
I'm, I'm still an idealist, I guess, but I'm sort of thinking like, really? Like, or what, what would be the way they're looking, they, looking at it, walking the dog there? Is that the place to, to do it? Would it be a different experience than in walking in a pine forest? I don't think it's uh, the problem of uh, either capitalism or socialism. It's just uh, non-understanding of uh, sustainable future. So, uh, it's uh, usually uh, not understood and can be from socialism or, or from capitalism part, both, both ways. But uh, in terms of well, cutting forests, say, it's uh, interesting to, to know that uh, uh, currently, Estonia is exporting uh, biomass, energetic biomass, uh, just at that amount, w what uh, our country was, at, as a whole, using energy uh, 100 years ago, with more or less of the same population, more or less uh, we, we didn't eat much more, uh, we, we are not eating much more now, so uh, uh, actually uh, the happy, I think the, we, many people had happy life also 100 years ago, uh, but uh, with much less energy. I guess this um, makes me think of something I've thought about a bit, which is how the sort of the motives behind these maybe corporate decisions often people, I like that you're saying, why don't we not demonize them? Because I think these, the interests behind those decisions to clear cut, for example, and keep clear cutting and keep clear cutting. I don't know if Estonia, for example, I don't want to be the devil's advocate economist here, but I don't think we have much other raw resources and the state wants to grow. The state wants to become bigger and bigger. That's just what states do in the modern global neoliberal economy. And if you don't have any other raw resources, you just have to do it. And that, that's sort of this global world that the lay women, they're like, oh, like lay people, etc. They're like, that's terrible, that's evil. And, and they're coming at it without seeing this sort of way that Estonia as a nation state is completely entangled within this planetary sort of neoliberal economic practice. I'm not... It's not, it's a rough thought, but. but. One thing that's often talked about in America is that the aesthetics of capitalism have changed. That say in the 1950s, the heads of these companies never wanted to make so much more money than the people who worked for them. They just said, well, we can't have salaries so much higher than the workers, it just would be wrong. And then over the decades, the CEOs have decided, you know, we should make hundreds, thousands times more money than the people who work for us, that, that this is a good, this proves we're better businessmen, our companies are better. And it's just like the whole, I guess even as well, the ethics has changed, people have different ideas of how you should behave in business. And that it's just sort of appeared and, and, and people have just went with it instead of realizing that it all started out with, with, with not such grandiose aims for bigger, 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 bigger. And that in the times when this form of government and economics had more universal support, it wasn't the only thing going. There were other principles that mattered more, like decency or not getting too big, caring about your community and things like that. These things have gotten more subservient to more and more and more, we need more money, bigger companies buying other companies. There should just be one, one company in this industry, one in this one. And that's not really how it was supposed to thrive. It's, I have a book recommendation just to exactly about this because obviously uh, United States of America also you know sees the dead end in, in with the current ways of, of uh, moving forward and or some of us some and then uh, there's uh, this author Dar Jamel who wrote book on the end of ice and I read that being particularly interested in glaciers and ice and, and all all that science behind it, but he also ended up being so depressed that now his next book is We Are uh, the Middle of Forever. Maybe you even have it in this amazing bookstore. But at, uh, basically this uh, greed has different names in Native Americans' um, vocabulary, in, depending on which, which tribe we're talking about. And this book is really learning from indigenous voices from uh, Turtle Island on, on the changing earth. And uh, so this is a, 
the natives call it a disease that you have to just watch out for. It's a disease. Greed is a disease, and they have very interesting different names for it. So as, as you describe, it's just grown, you know, it just grows as you eat. And, and as all diseases, they should be, you know, faced, but we really haven't, right? There hasn't been a reason enough, not a reason that really uh, hits into your core, like a deepest place that you really are afraid of, I don't know what, losing life? I don't know, what, what would change? What would cause that change? Or, or facing the disease? On aesthetic aspect also here, say uh, aesthetics is about the values, but not quantitative, but qualitative values. Say, but the value, uh, what is leading uh, our economy, our c contemporary life in many, many aspects is just numbers. Say, that's, uh, well, ordering, uh, say, who is best at measuring that. Say, that's, uh, that uh, measure, measurement in that direct uh, and fundamental sense, of course, uh, is very different from aesthetic value. So that, uh, yeah, uh, that means here that um, we, uh, we, together with eco aesthetic, as, as uh, well, uh, we would point on those values which we find more important than numbers. Can a corporate boss be an uh, admirer of eco aesthetics? Yeah, of course. There's so many who've made it the center of their business vision. Some more honest than others. You know, it's, it's, they still want to make money, but lots of companies make nature and eco aesthetics and helping the environment the center of their 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 ethos, what they think they're doing. Whether they could do it honestly, you know, probably some. Mm -hmm. I, I would think a forestry company could do that because it's a renewable resource. There has to be a sustainable way to grow trees and cut them down. And surely there are some around the world. But there, if you're motivated by the greatest profit in the shortest amount of time, you're going to clear cut a whole area. And you're going to cut these big old trees that maybe shouldn't be cut. But if you think in the long term, you can have a forestry business that just thins out, that just cuts down some trees and do fine. I would love to see that. Vayim, you wanted to say something. I guess I just, if the if we think of the CEO or like we, we're sort of painting a, uh, a sort of limited picture if we're saying the CEO is the ev evil or the, the company is evil because these are cultural practices that we're talking about that live on in many people's heads that are carried on generation by generation and encoded in institutions. It's not just the CEO, I think. It's, it's asking about how are cultural values and norms related to growth and profit? How are those carried on and reproduced constantly and how are how can we maybe get in the way of that? I think the CEO is just a, a symbol maybe of like a, like a perfect outcome of that cultural algorithm that's been running you know, maybe for a couple hundred years at this point. But I think it's much more complicated and I like to, I try to complicate that picture because these are cultural beliefs and practices we're talking about. Yeah, we've been you know, infected. It's infection. Well, it's it's throughout all the levels and layers, but again, not to demonize anybody, anybody and anything, but it's, is that true? I don't know if this is a fact that about 100 corporations really are deciding a lot of things for the humankind. Basically, if, if the species will, uh, will um, live on, um, you know, we, us, us here trying to recycle with different bins, that's just really for our own comfort. That is not going to make a difference. I, I'd like to believe in little tiny acts matter and in big choir, a single, uh, every singer has a voice and it adds up, but it's really, it has to be very systemic change if, if, if any change would come. True, uh, CEOs and politics have a lot of power, more than, more than we want and more than they should. Um, David, maybe you want to play some music and then we'll continue the conversation about half an hour. Yeah, I, I was just going to play uh, for a few minutes an example of what we're talking about, how uh, 
you know, for me, with all with training as a philosopher and writing books like this about beauty and nature, survival of the beautiful and evolution, over time I've gotten more interested in just sort of doing doing it, like learning from nature by getting in touch with it more. And sometimes technology, as Yannicka pointed out, really can help. Like you can take a bird song. Um, you're still going to hear me. Like, like the hermit thrush, a famous bird song that... Um, that, uh, you know, it just sort of sounds like this. He says it sounds like this. This bird is praised by uh, people like Thoreau and John Burroughs and, and even T.S. Eliot as among the most beautiful of bird songs. And then it, it kind of goes by, each phrase is kind of different but it's a little fast and high for humans to hear. So like uh, technology can bring it, you can slow it down, bring the pitch down, make it more humanly comprehensible. And it's something that's just gotten much easier to do with like computers and, you know, and so we can, we can get into this world of this bird and start to hear what it's doing by moving it into our own aesthetic realm. And if you make it even slower, it becomes something that basically I just want to play along with. Same thing, just more. So, I mean, one, one simple way to define eco-aesthetics is just to learn from the music of nature. It's right there. It's pretty easy to find these things out in the world around us. Uh, but we're kind of taught not to take them so seriously. And lately, people have been asking me, like, oh, come on, do you really think birds make music? And then I started answering, I know birds are making music. I'm not sure humans make music because these birds have been doing this for millions of years. They know what's right. They know what to sing. And we're constantly playing around, changing things. We're not sure what we like, what we don't. That's the nature of human life, this uncertainty, this constant change, which can get us in so much trouble, but it also leads us to create so many beautiful, surprising things. But the birds and whales and bugs and the wind, you know, Nature knows all this stuff. It's just been there. It's going to be there after us. We don't have to worry about nature. But we have so much we can learn from it if we just take it more seriously.
I wanted to ask, um, what is the strength uh, in creative field to address the problems of ecology and talking about eco aesthetics? What is the what is the power in in so called soft power? Uh, for me, it has to do with the body. You know, I mean, as a performer, as a live performer, we're talking about communicating like in a sort of preconceptual, pre-verbal place um, through, I think about ritual and how, how sort of intense these moments of live performance are and what's being transmitted and what's being felt in this sort of web of multi-sensory present moment, non techno you're talking about technology and all this hyperspeed, maintaining 12 different things at the same time, that sort of schizophrenic way of being, especially in a city, especially in a big city, in the live moment of performance, you're, you're sort of, for a temporary, for a small fraction of time, you're coming out of that high speed highway. And the body is more susceptible, I think. The, the body can receive things that when you're, when you're going down that highway at full speed, you're not so receptive to. And, I think there's a lot of stuff that in the pre-verbal, pre-conceptual space that, that can be very much felt. You know, I think about affect here and sort of what happens before you name an emotion, before you actually conceptualize what's going on, what comes before that. And I think as a performer, there's a lot of very powerful things that can be done in that space. Yeah, I think you can't count right away these kind of influence, right? It's like you can't really put it into numbers, talking of numbers and, and others. How do you quantify it? But it's, it's really true. And uh, so I hear you when you say that this is to, one is slowing down and also opening up so you can, you can uh, let things in that we, you know, guarding, guarding open. So I find like in my case, I have to admit, art has been a way to survive. It's been a way to survive. And I think if I can, I can figure out how to survive through depression of losing all these beautiful life forms, then by now I can offer it to somebody else. Like perhaps there's somebody else because I'm not so different from other humans. That it is a universal way. It's um, uh, creating images and spaces, utopian perhaps, that do not exist yet, offering place to slow down, reflect, be really vulnerable, asking from, for help from my audience members, just asking for help. We can't do it alone. Like the collaborative spirit is, is definitely uh, very, very important. That's why I've left mostly my studio space and gone out to public spaces to performances or create artworks that can change over exhibition run. And that is another way where I invite audience members to, to influence and take responsibility or care for these artworks and their future. At the moment in New York, there's an exhibition on water, a beautiful, I think six artists exhibition, very different uh, approaches to water. And so I have this giant uh, cur um, curved drawing on plastic that has a water soluble lines and they disappear over the exhibition run. So ice is put above the drawing and then it slowly drips onto it and washes it away and people can come back and watch what it looks like next week, next week, next week. And so I, I don't know. So perhaps if I I've, I've was helped and I'm more whole, I can go and, and create these spaces of, of, of um, being together, feeling lost, and perhaps some push to take the next step and, and go on. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to, to, to know more, come to Venus to advertisement moment, right? We have a whole program on Thursday, so, and Puent Bookstore has, has even my book, book here too, so <laughs> anyway. These are the, I do believe in the power of art very strongly, actually more than maybe after I graduated graduate school. We are, we are really happy to have such uh, uh, eco artists here uh, in Estonia and to say more and more of them, uh, Vaim and Janik and David and Peter Lauritz and Janerem and several others say, and uh, uh, 
uh, uh, one rule what eco eco ecological artist uh, has to do that is uh, to be uh, sort of translator uh, demonstrating helping uh, other people to to see uh, uh, how the other living beings uh, will see the world uh, the, their aesthetic, uh, how that looks like. It's hard to, to grasp without uh, translators. So, uh, that's, uh, the, well, in this way, via ecological artists, we can uh, get closer to umwelten of other beings. I mean, in addition to, you know, economically convincing people that, you know, they're going to save money by saving the earth. The biggest way to get people interested in nature is aesthetic reasons. For example, if you think about the, the conservation of whales in the ocean, people were not interested in saving whales until they heard the song of the humpback whale. And that really grabbed people. They just thought it was incredibly beautiful and surprising. And this... Um, you know, this is what got people to want to save the whales, this recording in 1970. Believe it or not, this is what, this is what got people excited, that, that the fact that th these animals nobody could imagine were singing underwater. Silent. And, uh, and so it was the fact that they had this beautiful song that made people want to stop killing them in such numbers, and there's much less hunting of whales today than there used to be because of the beauty of their song. And that just re can remind us how aesthetics can make people care more about something that, that previously they didn't value that's right around us, that's essential for human continuity and survival, that to recognize that we're a part of nature, we need nature, and we can learn so much from it, not only pragmatic things, but just the sense of beauty and the wonder of the, the, that we could fit into this amazing world around us. And uh, what role does the vernacular and ugly play in eco aesthetics? Both these terms from human perspective, of course, because this is the only perspective we have. Uh, are you saying they're the same? Vernacular and ugly are the no, same? No, it's, uh, no, I don't say it. it's the same. <laughs> I think rage or extreme grief are very ugly emotions and very uncomfortable and living in a moment of crisis, I think those kinds of emotions, even if we might not be conscious of them, they're very much beneath the surface because we're aware of what's happening, we're aware of what's going on around us. And I think coming back to the idea of like tapping into the preconceptual, precognitive, that's where I think those ugly emotions or ugly experiences of life and you know, neoliberal planetary capitalism, the plantation economy, whatever you want to call it, in that light crisis, that, that life crisis, the crisis we're in, for me, that's the role that ugliness can, can play is sort of tapping into those very ugly emotions and giving people permission to feel them because I don't think many of us actually feel permitted to express or feel those things that are very much, I think, beneath the surface. But don't you think so much art today is just ugly? Like, on not purpose? At all. Like, it just mm. wants to be, wants to ju be jarring and not pleasant to look at and, and wants to delve into this. this I think there's uh, a lot of good reasons for yeah. that. But I'm saying that they're interested, like, it's part of the aesthetics yeah. to really, uh, you know, to not, in fact, the f even notion we're bringing beauty up is, is often something that uh, someone will tell you, don't just think about beauty that shouldn't guide your aesthetic creation. This is, this is what I called a uh, new wave of post-humanism in contemporary art trend, and I wrote my master's thesis also about tell it. Tell us, what do you think? <laughs> does is post does, does post-humanism uh, favor the ugly in some at way? At the moment, I'm at the moderator's role, so... No, you're allowed to weigh <laughs> in, you know. I will, I will tell you later okay. uh, with the pleasure. Um, Janik, I wanted also to say something about the ugliness and vernacular. Yeah, I started thinking of, of sublime, maybe for some reason, although it's not vernacular, maybe, but, but you know, the beautiful saying also that the beauty is in, in, uh, in the viewer's eyes. And 
So, you know, obviously, shifting angles, how we see things, perceive things, that's artist role too. And it could include, you know, just perceiving something, not changing ugly into nice and then we love it, but sort of expanding and stretching these uh, tentacles that we have to to uh, not only push away, but perhaps embrace and see what it does. And I think maybe that connects to what you said, that you let those, whether it be emotions or visual ugliness, to push you towards something, because there is this um, transformation or power of, of course, polarities. I don't want to polarize them, but yeah. Uh, do you think uh, nature, animals, bacteria, and all the other forms of beings can have a sense of the ugly. And I'm thinking if a wolf sees a de dead deer, it's not repelling, it's the juice of life for the wolf. Same for the birds who come and get their fair share from the dead animal, and then insects come and take their part. There is nothing ugly about the dead animal, it's just there. So do you think animals can sense ugly? That means we should somehow generalize the concept of ugliness. So that probably one way to do it is to just to, to see that ugly also means that, well, th think about just uh, if there are ugly colors uh, somewhere in the design, that means the, the colors do not fit. And that are they do not fit, that, that means they are ugly. Say therefore, unf unfitting, uh, say is obviously one important feature here. And now uh, that, of course, uh, happens uh, always uh, in in life. Simply, humans can do it well, being aware of that and say consciously, intentionally, um, make ugly things. Uh, probably, other living beings never do um, intentionally any anything ugly. Uh, it just happens they are, well, life otherwise is very positive and say, towards removing this unfitness while uh, humans can, are here different, they can intentionally make something unfitted and ugly. Well, there is a lot of human debate about this, of course. Like somebody puts up this building and the person putting it up says it's beautiful. It's strong, it's, it's great, it's big, it's expensive. And someone else says it's the ugliest thing they've ever seen. But your question is more about animals and aesthetics. And there's certainly cases where there's animals really wrapped up in aesthetic thought, like bowerbirds in Australia and New Guinea. They build these sculptures. They're not nests. They're artworks, and each species has its own kind of artwork it builds, and one bird, the satin bowerbird, decorates everything with blue. The other one takes like caterpillar shit and attaches it to the end of something that looks like a Christmas tree. Like you could see these things in art exhibits today all over the world, and the birds have been making them for millions of years. And they're, they're aesthetic creations. Evolution has evolved in these rare cases, the need for these animals to think about beauty. And we might think they're ugly, but in the, in the evolution of this animal's aesthetic sense, you know, they just need to make these things. They have a value, and it's something often forgotten about evolution that Darwin wrote, you know, in The Descent of Man. He said, birds have a natural aesthetic sense. They appreciate beauty, and that is why they've evolved beautiful songs and beautiful feathers. That aspect of evolutionary theory has mostly not been studied much or taken that seriously as opposed to survival of the fittest, where everything has its place, it's all pragmatic and practical. Nature is not all pragmatic and practical. It's full of this weird, wild, crazy stuff. William, maybe your example has to do with just humans being afraid of death, and that's why it looks ugly, or we, we translate ugliness into, into this particular scene you're describing. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to ask something about birds. I just recently uh, came across over a Google image of a pigeon's nest, and I never knew what the pigeon's nest looks like. And uh, it, it looks like few branches just dropped on top of each other. It's not even like beautiful, you know, made nest, like, like, uh, like a stork nest, for example, but it's just like, 
on the ground like few uh, <laughs> few branches and and I wanted to ask uh, maybe you know is is it how they actually make nests and and what is the reason behind this very sad looking nest? I don't know anything about pigeon <laughs> nests, but what for what your sounds like it's like either the pragmatics or the aesthetic of the pigeon is that it's kind of minimalist doesn't need much it's like it's like this yeah, is my house yeah but what does it it's even give here. that it has this it doesn't need branches. the pigeons are so strong there's so many of them like they don't care there's so many they don't need to protect themselves because they're just going to live maybe something like that some birds can just handle anything starlings house sparrows pigeons any environment you're going to find them they just go where was the picture can we see that would be interesting to see because of no has anybody seen a pigeon's nest? Uh, pigeon. Sure, I have not. Yeah. I have not but too uh, either. I, I'm pretty sure that is uh, beautiful for pigeon for themselves. Say, uh, if you just uh, look how how they build their nests, uh, or uh, they are well, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, their way to decide is certainly different from ours. So therefore, for us, it seem it may seem it is not beautiful, but that's our vision, not there. Uh. Exactly. This is this is something that I wanted to uh, reach to, and I encourage everyone to Google pigeon's nest because it's quite a spectacle. What kind of pigeon are we talking? About? Not specific, okay. specific, uh, specified. Sorry, specified. But about the insect and bacteria thing that I mentioned in my previous question, what I was describing was actually a symbiosis. Uh, Timothy Morton has said symbiosis is a very interesting thing because it's always a sort of fragile, continent, uneasy relationship in which it's impossible to ter determine which entity is the top entity, quote, and, but humans, they, or actually we, always need to be the top entity, uh, which makes it impossible to be in symbiosis with that, uh, another living entities. Um, of course, our bodies have gut bacteria, etc., cetera, uh, which we kind of are in symbiosis with, but it is that the contemporary human mind, I unknown unknowingly denies the concept of symbiosis and therefore <coughs> distance, uh, distances themselves from all the other beings. At least this is something that I was thinking about when I was reading this Timothy Morton quote about being on top of the symbiosis. Do you have any thoughts about it? I think he's got a good point. I, I just want to challenge the idea that um, the contemporary human mind is when we use that word, we maybe generalize or universalize. I think we're talking about a culturally specific, maybe Western, maybe like European or like sort of first world country mind, because I think there's a lot of, even their grandparents, you talk about the need and the relationship they have with the land that's need based. That's a very different way of relating to nature or thinking about symbiosis or even just living symbiosis by need. So. I think it's important to just acknowledge that there's a lot of different groups of people around the world who are sort of interacting and living symbiosis very differently than the one that's very a alienated from that. Uh, actually, it's not precisely true that humans always want to be on the top, say, because if, if you are among friends, just in a good friendship company, Nobody wants to be on the top, say. Uh, if friendship is possible among humans, and uh, we, can, we know how to do that, so why not with other living beings? It's very simple. Just let's be friends. Some people just live in a house full of cats, for example. And the cats are like in charge. That topic is also in the book. I can't let's emphasize, the, uh, because the indigenous people here talk about the uh, kinship you know they start from just the kinship with your you know friends and 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 maybe human human kin but then it extends to all kin or other and uh, not only on on our uh, human uh, linear time but also the deep time into future and 
and into the past. And so it's a very different sense of interconnectedness and reciprocity that it really is a living, real thing. And how can we, like how can we, or more of us as, as, as human species to really sense that reciprocity and that connectedness and that it, it is, it's good. Like for me, for example, even the experience of, of living in these two different societies as uh, living in Estonia, living in, in the US, I've, you know, it's, it's so different to be in an artist company, for example, here or over there, the, the competition, to, you, you'll s soon be able to tell because Vaim has done the other way. He's come from the North, Amer North America to be in Estonia. So it's kind of interesting, but the competitiveness, like it's tough and the individualism in some ways, it's even... Which place is more competitive? Goodness, I went to graduate school in New York and I thought like, oh, am I only going to say something if I have something to say? And then I was listening, starting to pay attention to what people were saying, they said nothing. And the ones who said the loudest actually, you know, really hadn't really, you know, prepared for, <laughs> for the class, basically, or for the seminar. And, uh, but, but, the, but the need to, you know, like, I don't know, that was very different from, obviously, our Soviet ed education, there was no individuals, so that was a whole other, whole other story. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people and politicians who don't want to be friends with nature and in kinship with other beings. Like, for example, I was very disturbed when I uh, last weekend heard uh, a panel discussion in Opinion Festival, Arvamus Festival, and uh, two um, of the leaders of the main like right-wing parties, Martin Helme especially, told that climate change doesn't exist. It's a hoax. Uh, it's the biggest hoax of our time. Um, and, uh, and on the other hand, uh, these same politicians are the one who are so worried about our traditional values, about the traditional land, about the, our like birth rate, etc. So it's a very paradoxical, um, it's a very paradoxical situation, and I wanted to ask, what do you think about this? Why are the people who are the loudest about the traditional values are actually the most mean uh, towards the, the environment that they should protect? One possible explanation is that these conservatists, uh, cons uh, or uh, that kind of right-wing people, they are not uh, conservative enough. They are just uh, because real conservatism comes from Greens. So that's indigenous values uh, which go up to other living beings. Mm -hmm. That is the, the way to be conservative truly. I remember uh, we had a very interesting discussion about uh, this left, uh, left Greens or, or, or right Greens with uh, Jakob von Uxkull Jr., uh, who established the Right Livelihood Award and uh, the Estonian Renaissance Award and uh, has been one of uh, leaders in European Greens uh, for, for s some decades ago. So he uh, was very worried that somehow uh, green uh, politics has been uh, mostly uh, related to, to left wings because it should, in the same way at least, be related to right thing, uh, wing. So, and that's just, uh, they do not understand their own path enough. I mean, you know, in America, it was conservative politics that were first interested in conserving nature. It came from the right wing. And then over time, it, it became an issue everyone agreed about. The left and right said, at least we all agree on preserving nature. But what happened is that um, politicians are very pragmatic. They mostly want to get reelected. They care more about that than any truth, any policy, anything else. It turned out that people liked more and more extreme ideas. They wanted to think less. They just liked slogans. And they just wanted this extreme rhetoric that pitted people against each other. And that's one of the most disturbing things in the political discourse today, that we've gone in that direction instead of towards more consensus and working together. I don't know how to explain it exactly, or I guess what to do about it is really sit down and talk to people who really disagree with each other and be sure that we recognize the excesses on the left and the right, both sides 
are often against truth and facts and just hold to their own beliefs. And that to recognize there's this tendency to not want to think more deeply on these problems because it, it just gets you more confused. People want something simple. We have to go beyond that, and realize it's all kind of complex, interesting, confusing, and we have to get together with people where everyone doesn't agree. And that's hard to do sometimes. Yes, we need to learn how to, how to have a dialogue again. Um, but our time is quite up. Thank you very much all for the very interesting conversation. I'm very glad to be here with you. Thank you all the listeners. And um, maybe before I give the mic to the audience, uh, I wanted to ask all of you, do you do you have anything to say or do you want anything uh, that the listeners would know but I didn't maybe tackle this topic in, uh, in this conversation? Some last words before the open mic. So how to get over these current problems? Uh, we listed and uh, what actually was behind or to organizing this round table the advice is uh, practice eco aesthetics i think any yeah practice where you kind of could accumulate um hmm I guess it's different for e everyone, but it's it's good to have a practice where you kind of uh, I guess David kind of said it already. Practice of of, of uh, meeting something that you don't expect to meet, and 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 having the conversations that are really really tough, and even if they are with with a melting piece of ice or 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 a squirrel or. Like that is really is a tough one. I just had a very tough conversation with my son, so it's like it's really uncomfortable. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's really worth it. So it's same things about I guess in other topics and with other species, like just species. I I really want you actually to include also the winds and all those so-called invisible things that are so powerful, so powerful. All these storms and hurricanes that hit New York made me really <coughs> internally turmoiled and made me to do what I do now as an artist in, in many ways. So those species too, the air and, and, and ice and uh, water. And Thank you. Thank you all, Janika, Baim, Kalevi, David audience any questions and also do we have the facebook um uh facebook questions maybe please feel free Okay, um, uh, human race or human beings have been considered as a top predators so agree not agree but if yes uh, what do you think uh, is us uh, uh, looking at uh, or hoping to get something from eco aesthetics? Is it like cat playing with a mouse, or is there a deeper meaning to grasp? Is there a message what we have to grasp? So thank you. Good question. Got us all thinking. Are you saying like we, we, we should r consider ourselves top predators or recognize that we're not top I predators? I think the question was like, what is the undercover uh, goal of a human to be uh, uh, value the eco aesthetics? Like, do we have anything? We Your life is better if you pay attention to what's around you and take it more seriously and learn f from it. It's just a, it's just a good thing to do. You know, it's going to help you out. Mm, truly, uh, humans are not top predators. We can be also eaten up. Uh, we, we behave as a very top predator. Yeah. 
until we get but it enough. So the question was whether uh, uh, a good deal of the Empire State was defeated by Buddha, like a cat playing with the, with the, with the mouse. So it's just playing. Or he, in the Empire State, sent the peace and message. Well, it's not just playing, you know, yeah. like you, you, you know, it's, it's what do you do with that forest? How do you cut it down? Do you leave it up? How do you live with the world around us? It's not just a game, it's life. It's like the real stuff. Nothing is more real than this. You know, if you yeah. pollute your entire environment, you can't live in this place anymore. So that's pretty serious stuff. It's not just a game. If you recognize that we need nature, you're not going to overdo it. You're going to take some, but not take everything. You're going to respect maybe, what's Maybe just here. that we shouldn't identify ourselves as cat, say, but maybe more as a mouse or... Uh, or, or s s but I, I think, like, the question is, like, are we, pl are we the cat playing with the mouse? I think I see it more the mouse is always playing with us. We're always entangled with the mouse. We're stuck with the mouse in the mud. And eco, like, that's what eco-aesthetics is, is, like, acknowledging how we're connected we are a mouse. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Uh, I just wanted to. I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to provoke uh, provoke uh, maybe further discussion there in front, uh, because I had I think a very strong eco aesthetic experience. It happened about uh, like let's say ten or fifteen years ago. I was walking by a fresh cut. Uh, lawn, and uh, and suddenly instead of typically I've had like this fresh cut lawn gives you kind of a somehow pleasant feeling, but suddenly I was I felt that I was uh, shocked because I understood that is is the blood of the grass, and and at that moment uh, from that moment on I have had difficulties in smelling uh, fresh cut grass. Just because I think that it's a lived be living being that has been cut. So in, in this sense, this was maybe an ugly eco aesthetics experience. <laughs> Just do, wanted to do you remember you. What, what made it, what, what caused that? The smell. The, the smell. smell. Just but one day, the smell affected Just one you different. And, and, and that was like a shock for me. And, and I think that was an eco aesthetic experience, considering from like we were discussing of ugly beauty, and so on. So just want to share this with you. Kala, correct me if I'm wrong, but what the grass is sending out, are, that, are those not pain signals, like communicating to other grass around it that I'm being cut down help? Uh, that is a very interesting point, actually, what you are making. It's, cl it's pretty clear that, uh, say, to cut the lawn, uh, so that it uh, reduces uh, the whole, whole biodiversity there is not a good idea. So, and that's uh, the practice what now uh, this uh, city ecology, city ecologists try to, to try to change. And that's uh, certainly a good thing now to not to cut so open. On the other hand, say, uh, we shouldn't think that uh, being a doing the best thing in, in, uh, from eco-aesthetic eco or ecological point of view that we shouldn't cut at all, say, because that o that's also would be wrong to think that we shouldn't hunt uh, game at all, say. Uh, that, uh, that means here this absolute uh, conclusion would not be uh, right again. However, say, to hunt or to cut or to kill, say, it, it, too much would be certainly wrong. So that's, that's a functional uh, perspective. I'm talking about the experience. I'm talking about yeah. the aesthetic experience right. uh, where uh, nature kind of met, met me in, in a very, uh, of course, like mm -hmm. we have uh, rational and practical things to do, but I just want to share this. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very, very good example, anyhow. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned the corporations cutting down the forest, so I've got a question. Why isn't there a law that uh, uh, makes it compulsory if you cut down the forest to plant a new one? Or is there a law? Or if there isn't a law, why isn't there? And what can we do to actually make a law like that? Because maybe sometimes they do plant, but there are a lot of empty spaces and that really bothers me. Thank you. 
That there exists also in Estonia that kind of regulation, but it's n not enough, and that is uh, also has a side effect. What is very bad, that means uh, planting itself is uh, usually reducing uh, diversity. So uh, if the forest and the ecosystem can renew by itself, that's a guarantee that it's much higher diversity than in case of planting. So therefore, uh, the planting uh, has this uh, bad side effect. So that means uh, th that has to be somehow, again, regulated then. That, uh, but otherwise, yes, uh, so, uh, but first thing, just we shouldn't cut so much. So is there a special law already? There is a regulation. What says, uh, well, uh, that those who cut have to um, uh, have to take care of, uh, yeah, of planting. And, and it also has quite a, quite a characteristic, uh, characteristic visual, which is that you have this clean cut forest and then one tree, which is the seeding tree, uh, which should plant this uh, new forest. But this is not where the biodiversity lives. So it's theoretically there, but in reality, it's, uh, it's brutal. Any other questions? Yes, a uh, slightly more conceptual one. So I can imagine very well what uh, eco-aesthetics would look like in visual arts, um, design, music and sound, but um, do you have any propositions as to what it would look like or, or seem like when applied on text? Great question. <laughs> and there's, there's probably the most, un, not surprisingly, written about this in terms of text, where um, you know some writers are trying to get beyond the cliche that we only see things from the human perspective and there's so much writing from the perspective of animals and there's one novel I know from the perspective of, of a yew tree that's a few thousand years old. The tree is like talking like, yeah, I know what life's like and all these people come and go. So writers can really go directly into this stuff and play with our, um, with our uh, conventions. There's a wonderful book by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas who wrote a lot of nonfiction anthropology books she wrote a novel called Reindeer Moon that really deal, deals with the idea like, okay, what is it like a people, sometimes animals, sometimes people, sometimes they become the dead. So the characters just morph into animals and their an own ancestors as the story goes in a matter of fact way as nothing being special. So there's in fact so much uh, literature that's about this. I, I just I was reading this new book, the kind of book that should be on the shelf here by I think her name is Elvira Wilk. She, she wrote a novel called Oval. Her new book is a bunch of essays called Death by Landscape. And she just streams through really quickly all these examples of literature that are taking the non-human perspective. She read this book, this book, this book. She's read so much cool stuff I'd never heard of. So I think there's a lot of uh, attempts you know, in literature to get beyond the human side, even though, of course, we're people. All we have are words. but we can instantly imagine and learn from what we know about what it's like to be another animal. Even von Uxkull, the founder of um, biosemiotics, was very impressed by ticks. He wanted to see what the world looked like from the perspective of a tick, and he really got into this. So I think there's a lot that can be done with words. Is it, yeah, it's working. Continuing on this, um, how would you judge, wait, how do I say it? Like with, with your examples, we are sort of as humans giving voice to nature, but do you think we're actually, like do we actually have the right to do it? Because we, do, we know how nature sounds through our ears, but we can't really give a voice to a tree because we're not, let's say, in our current state, able to communicate with the tree to then understand how it's speaking? It's a, also a great question. I, I think today people, especially in, in colleges, worry too much about being afraid to take anyone's perspective but their own. That's just f the wrong, that's kind of misguided fear 
Like, we should take other people's perspectives. I should pretend to be an Indian. I should pretend to be a black person. I should pretend to be from here or here and take different people's perspectives. Maybe I get it right. Maybe I get it wrong. I learn from people. I talk to people. We should constantly share and welcome each other's experiences and know that any writer, any artist, any thinker gets it all wrong half the time. But we can learn. We shouldn't be afraid of other species or people's points of view. And sure, if someone complains and say, you got my perspective wrong, you can talk to them and see whether they're right. Often people don't even know their own perspective. Like someone could write about me a lot better than I could write about myself. Yeah, I would say so too. Imagine like if you ever never try or too afraid to be in, in looking at things from any other perspective, right? And I'm thinking like the most I've learned is really like tripping totally out on, on, on letting all the sounds, all the sensations that I can possibly take in um, influence me and then taking the agency in some ways and being it. Is that allowed? Can I ever be wind? Something as enormous and incredible and powerful and gentle and tough and loving? I can't, but I, here I am in a humble way, sort of like, yeah, it, it, it moves me. So I, I let that to move me and, and yeah. But I think if you just naively jump into like taking a bunch of different perspectives and experimenting radically, oh, look at me, I'm, I'm so great, I can take on all these things. I think you have to be very careful of what kind of logics or what cultural practices you're carrying through there because there's a lot of violence that can be done, I think, when you just willy-nilly, oh, I'll try this, I'll try that, oh, and I take that on. The tree can't talk back to us. And I think it's important to really think about how can you work alongside or work with non-living things, especially who don't have a human voice. They definitely have voices. They definitely send messages, but it's about how do we tune into that message, which is not through text or thought. The reason why I was asking was actually because um, I'm working in this design studio and we recently did another, we have this exhibition called Cambio, which is about the global timber industry. And it recently moved to Helsinki with, where we made it more Finland specific. Um, but one installation that we made previously already in 2019 was a video called Quercus, which was uh, scripted by this philosopher Emanuela Gocha, who wrote from the perspective of the oak tree. Um, and he made this narrative where the oak tree was speaking in this um, genderless voice about how they are much older than any human being here. and how they see the world and it was sort of this LIDAR scan through the forest going under the roots and stuff and in a way it was really cool to do it and to be there and to look at look through the perspective of the oak at the same time I felt a bit guilty for um, being on the side of the human and narrating through video how the tree would think and feel so that's more where my question was stemming. But I do agree that allowing these forces to move you and feel with them, it's a really powerful practice. I think if the starting point is, you know, already from within as much as possible, then, you know, yeah, I, I guess that could be wrong approach. But still, like, if, if you start from not being separate or not, right, from within the, the whole ecosystem or, yeah. There's a, a great artwork I saw by this artist, Andre Chantal, who lives in Berlin. And it was an installation with a big uh, oyster mushroom colony in the middle, some mushroom books you could read, and two videos. And one of them was a kind of mock documentary about fungi, how they communicate underground with cool graphics. And somebody's voicing over how interesting it is, and, the, and it's a new form of intelligence. OK, but the other video was made by the mushrooms themselves, as if they made a video. And it was in this weird language that sounded like and, and the video said, you know, you people talk about the Anthropocene, but this is the fungusine. We mushrooms are in charge. And every image was just the mushroom in the center circling around as if it was the most important thing. And so he made, he imagined how the mushrooms would make videos if they were making a nature documentary. And it wouldn't be like the human vision. It would be like me, mushroom, I'm in charge. 
and I found that work very powerful. I don't know how the real mushrooms feel about it, whether they're concerned they're being misrepresented, but it definitely showed, it, it very beautifully as a piece of eco-aesthetics, an artist dared to imagine what mushrooms might say, if they could say, if they wanted to speak, if they wanted to do these things that of course they don't want to do because they have a different kind of intelligence. But as an artwork, it was very successful and they dared to do this and play around and not be afraid. And I think that was a, a, you know, a bold move. You can watch some of it online, see what I'm talking about. I didn't just make that up, it really exists. Yeah, yeah. but this, uh, well, uh, trying to describe the other, other beings' perspective, oh. here is of course, uh, in the case of several examples, we can see that actually that perspective is very much anthropomorphic. Say, uh, like we, well, in children's books, uh, animals are speaking and talking. Say, and now also uh, this, well, oak tree or whomever. Say, and here indeed, in order to, to truly get to, to that perspective, that requires very much, well, serious well, work in understanding. And uh, here is this one field in science what's doing that, that attempting to reach that is, is biosemiotics now. And so, but that's in order to yeah, get to their perspective uh, because they are using different kind of logic. That's so much different logic that we, we have never learned that. And, uh, the, the differences they are making are truly so not imaginable at first and, and, and so on. They have different senses and everything that, and how to translate that, say that the translating process itself is, is incredibly, well, difficult, but uh, most interesting. Maybe, maybe some of you have seen this Estonian film, The Old Man and the Moose. And in this film, like the first 20 Joseph minutes. Matthews. Yeah, the first 20 minutes, just some dark nature scenes, just trees, there's no people, no moose just so slow, you just get into it, and then you see this guy walking around with these pieces of a tree like horns. He just walks through the woods, then you see some moose. There's no plot, no story. It's just this guy likes to hang out with the moose. And you, you, to, to even see this film, you have to get into some version of moose time, moose world, but by luring you in. So you first watch, you say, this is boring, nothing's happening, you know. It changes using the, media we're used to, film, but it, it plays with time and senses and environment. And we people have wonderful media that can do that. If we dare to go outside conventions, you can make really amazing works, you know, like what you're trying to do with this point perspective of the tree, you know, to really get us to perceive and experience the world in a different way. You know, none of this may solve our problems with nature, but technology is a wonderful way we can, we can get different perspectives. We shouldn't worry that we're stuck with our own perspective. We can remember that and be humble, but we can play, we can try things out, we can dare to experiment. Uh, just one question from the Facebook also. How do we reconcile our call uh, back to nature with an acceptance that the movement towards AI, artificial intelligence and technology and possible obliteration of the organic may just be another natural iteration of our evolution? How can eco-aesthetics help us here? Maybe you can repeat the question one more time. It was quite long. Yeah. How do we reconcile our call back to nature uh, with an acceptance that the movement towards technology may just be another natural iteration of our evolution? Well, on the one hand, the yeah, the question is, is like, how can we... Uh, really get back to nature as the world gets ever more technological and isn't this technology just another part of nature because we're part of nature, so where can we go with this? So I would say part of that question is, hey, if we're part of nature, then everything we do is nature, so big deal, which is something people often bring up. And so if you simply say humanity is part of nature and whatever we do is natural, you lose the moral and aesthetic weight of nature. It's all nature, okay. 
But that's kind of too simplistic and easy. In fact, we want to look around us and learn from what's there. And, and we, we, we have to earn our part in nature in a way. If you believe nature has some value, if you believe it, then it's not, it's not like everything we do is natural. Some things can be more natural than other parts. I think the other part of the question is, uh, hey, we're getting so technological here. Does this nat nature stuff really matter? And it's no surprise that question comes from online where it seems like you have this whole world, but it's not real. You know, th that's not reality. You know, always remember that uh, any form of artificial intelligence, machine learning, is only machines still trying to help us. And technology only works when it extends human um, initiative. And when people start to think that it's intelligent on its own, like that Google executive from a few months ago, you know, th this has always been there as long as there's been technology. People have thought that it's, it could be super intelligent. And it's really not that smart, you know because it doesn't have the desires and wants. And if you think intelligence is like solving puzzles and problems, then yeah, machines can be really helpful, but they rarely want to do anything with any real feeling or desire. Just an anecdote. I've, uh, I've, I've been in a d discussion, uh, a round table, where all, uh, all questions were asked by artificial intelligence. So that program who was just uh, understanding and create, not, uh, not understanding anything, but just uh, well, uh, via certain algorithm creating questions. This looked r very smart. <laughs> yeah, they look smart, but you know, the, the thing is that that just shows how we're not that smart. We can be fooled by, we can be fooled by music, by art, by anything that machines have created, because we don't know that much. We're not that smart. So we can be fooled by a lot of stuff. But I think this notion of desire and feeling and emotion, if you believe those things are real and not just chemicals and, and measurable quantities, then the machines are not going to you know, have so much of that. And some people think it's only a matter of time. You know, I've sat down and talked to Ray Kurzweil. He thinks the singularity is coming, but you know, it's, it's basically a faith. It's faith-based knowledge. If you believe in the machine, you can believe anything about them. But if you actually want to hang out with machines, you know, um, they're still more successful when they're bringing people together. Than Some people really stuff. like to hang out with machines, so... They do, but often there's <laughs> another person through the machine, you know. Absolutely. But Any other questions? Talk, but I was thinking since m some of my friends or or among uh, some of my friends like this e eco aesthetics has become a really trendy and a really awesome and fun and cool thing, and um, I was listening to Rob Henderson, I think was the philosopher who came up with this idea of uh, luxury beliefs, and. Uh, I had a question or maybe a small speculation. What are the cons? Like we can all think of the pros. I think when uh, eco-aesthetics becomes a really trendy and cool thing and everybody wants to do it and everybody wants to see it, but what are the cons of eco-aesthetics or what could they be if this whole idea or this belief of uh, biodiversity becomes, I don't know, superficial or becomes, yes, superficial, I think. So, yeah, what are the cons, or what do you think are the cons? Thank you. You know, I think the main thing is that humankind might survive. <laughs> and, you know, like, who needs that kind of species? But then again, here we are, and actually having a very meaningful conversation, so it might be s a little bit also sad if it wouldn't stick around for, <laughs> for a while, but that's... Um, I think it's good if it's trendy, you know, it, being trendy is good, but like any trend, you know, you want to be serious about it. You want to take it seriously and don't just uh, try it out because everyone else is. You, you want to think, what is it I'm trying out? Where do I want to go with this? And why am I doing it? Um, I, you know, I mean, a lot of rhetoric about politics say it's good if people do things because everyone else does it. That's one of the main reasons, ways we got people to get vaccinated 
around America is they find somebody they trust and get th that person to say, you've got to do this because it's trendy and the people you follow are doing it. And that uh, is one way people do th things. But I, th I think I, I urge, you know, I, I, I like, I believe everyone can really think for themselves and should, should before just going on with something, they should, uh, you know, think about why they're doing it and how they want to do it and how it connects to what matters to them. But I, I, I'm happy if it's trendy. It sounds cool. Very cool, very modern kind of trend. But trends change. Of course. Of course. One of the risks of eco aesthetics becoming trendy is maybe that the I think the logics of, for example, individualism or consumerism or perpetual growth, they're sort of I think of them as scripts that are running inside all of our heads all the time. They've been the sort of implanted through cultural practice, through the school system, etc. I think it's actually very difficult to evade those practices, those things that are encoded in, in our heads, those scripts, if you will. Eco-aesthetics becomes trendy, you practice those things. I think it's you have to really work hard cognitively, but also physically, like materially thinking about what's going on in that relationship to prevent that baggage from coming along with you into that eco-aesthetic world. But then to come back to the earlier point about trends that we talked about, I think you should also be aware of the material impact, even if it's a trend, is your microbiome healthier? Is it more diverse? Or is, is, a, is a plant being taken care of in a much more sustainable way? Great, that's a trend, but it has a material impact on, on the world. I have one, oh, sorry. <laughs> I have one uh, thought about this uh, con of, uh, of the eco-aesthetic trends. We all know that the trends are usually fading away quite fast in today's world and trends, like if they have been trend for some time after that, they become sort of uncool. So maybe this is the con that if uh, eco aesthetics is super trendy and cool now, then in five years, everybody's like, oh my God, it was cool like five years ago. Uh, now we're all about like technology and, uh, and hating the nature. I'm I'm very primitive here with my wording, but uh, but I think this might be maybe the con. Questions? So. Uh, just to comment, uh, the the one who was questioning the. Uh, the, the question before said also in the commentary that I'm pr I promise I'm not artificial intelligence. <laughs> I don't believe you. You sound like you're Politics. artificial Politics. intelligence. Yeah. We have four minutes. Yeah. Uh, we have four minutes left. So uh, any more questions? I see one hand there. Hello, uh, coming back to the artificial intelligence, <laughs> because I work with human-like virtual characters. So uh, I was wondering that what is the difference between us imagining uh, the trees or the mushrooms and their thoughts, etc., cetera, uh, uh, like being real, and then uh, imagining and projecting our own feelings to these uh, technical characters. Because at the very end, I think we all live in <laughs> Jakob von Uxkull's uh, Umwelt, where we are living in our own bubble, not even human, all humans in the same bubble, but every human in their own bubble, and, and we project our own, what, how we experience the world and how we, uh, so we uh, project our personality and our experiences to the others, but how do we know that that's actually real? Yeah, uh, because if we just pr uh, project uh, or just imagine, uh, then there is no difference. But it is possible to know how they know the world. And that is just uh, the, the most interesting stuff. And uh, that was that myth these methods, how to get the knowledge about the knowledge of other living beings uh, were very much established by Jakob von Uxkull, by the way. Thank you all. We have uh, time for one more question. 
Peter. Peter wants to say something. No? no? Okay. Well. Uh, this is coming out of left field a little bit, but I do feel like, especially since Vi mentioned uh, using um, their body several times, that I feel like there is a connection, an emotional connection between eco-aesthetics and the space of the erotic. And when we think about the ways in which we can practice um, a deeper type of eco-aesthetics in our daily lives, then it could be through a, a deep, caring, erotic connection with ourselves and with people that we hold close to us. Um, and I feel like Lord's uses of the erotic could be a nice connection point um, between, you know, the term aesthetics, which communicates visual mostly to me and th the sphere of the emotional, which seems so key in, in making it actually pertinent and lasting and potentially non-trendy. That's a beautiful question. I've been thinking a lot about the erotics of improvisation and especially improvisation in this more extended sense. Um, for me, it means you know leaving the concert hall, leaving the club, being in spaces where those cultural practices or norms are not as salient, one could say. And the, res the receptiveness that I sense in my own body to what's happening around me, to these, these flows of attention and sort of reciprocity and intensity during a performance between me and the space, between me and another performer who I'm improvising with, or the audience members, it's extremely, extremely erotic, but not in like a, it's almost less in a human way. It's in a very raw, very intense, again, thinking about the preconceptual, the preverbal. verbal it's, there's, it's, there's a violent quality to it, I would say. And uh, I've, I've been reading a lot about BDSM and sort of the altered states of consciousness that come from crossing the boundary between pain and pleasure and moving between those worlds. And I think, yeah, I think it's something that I'm just starting now to think about, but it's a very, very powerful and very, um, very important thing to think about with these things in mind. There is a book on that topic uh, by Andreas Weber. Andreas Weber, uh, the subtitle of the book is uh, Erotic Ecology. Shelf right there, behind us. But I'm, I'm erotic heckling. is always trendy, oh. so. Erotic is trendy. You Maybe that's what we should that. be it's always trendy. talking about. It will always be trendy. But, that, is trendy. but that book is particularly about eco aesthetics, and that is just important here. It's a great one. I heard him last summer at Biotopia, and I thought, like, wow, you know, that was really putting words into something that I had been only like practicing. I had no words for it. I thought, this is how it is. You, there's no other way to really connect than all with all the senses. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again, all the speakers. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Uh, thank you for listening to our talk. Thank you for the organizers. Thank you for the technical team. Thank you for uh, Buent Bookshop for hosting us. Uh, we'll stick around for a little bit. So we, if anybody has some questions or comments, you can just approach us. But the talk has ended for today. And thank you once again, and hopefully see you next time. Thank see you, you Lillian. Two days in Venice too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks.